Good afternoon. We're here from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We meet at Two Thornwood Terrace, and we'd love to see you come along. We meet tomorrow, the Lord's Day, at 11 a.m., and again we meet, meet in the evening at 6.30 p.m., and we do issue a warm and sincere welcome to you all to come along to hear. But you may well be asking, what will you hear? What will you hear when you come to our congregation? Well, friends, we make no apology. You will hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. You will hear about the truths of Christianity. Because sadly today we live in a day and a time when much of Christianity is not really known. But we have a gospel to proclaim. And we want to tell people about the gospel. And of course the gospel revolves around a person. And upon what this person has done. And of course the person is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who has come from heaven. He is the eternally begotten Son of God who became just like us. He took our form, he took our nature, and he did this in order that he might work out a salvation for us. Now I realize these are things that maybe are new to you. But we want to explain these things because these things are vitally important. The Son of God, if he had remained in heaven, could never save anyone. And we would not have a gospel to proclaim. But because the Son of God became man and became like us, he was able to save. You see, friends, he became a man in order ultimately that he might suffer and that he might die on Calvary's tree. As the Son of God, he could never suffer. He could never die. But when he became just like us, taking our form and nature, having a body like ourselves, and a true and a reasonable soul, as our catechism teaches us, it was in order that he might suffer. And not only that he would suffer, but that he would die. And that he would offer up himself that once for all perfect sacrifice. A sacrifice that satisfied the just demands of God's holy law. A law that all of us have broken. You see, friends, the Lord Jesus Christ came on a rescue mission. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And the Bible tells us, it does not flatter us, but it does tell us clearly that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And before these words that you will find in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we have these words inserted. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what that tells us, however much it might not flatter us, it tells us that in the sight of God, and that's what's important, not what men think, not what I think, not what the church thinks, but as far as God is concerned, we're all sinners and we're all guilty. We have broken God's law. Now you may well ask me, what is God's law? Well, you've heard of God's law. God's law is the Ten Commandments. The, God's law is the Ten Commandments. And friends, you know these commandments. How do I know that? Because they are written on your heart. But because of sin, they have in some sense been defaced. But the law of God in some sense is written in your heart. 
The first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And friends, as we consider that commandment, we have to acknowledge that we have broken the first commandment. How is it that we've broken the first commandment? We've broken the first commandment because God is not our God. We have replaced him with other gods. I don't mean that we bow down before idols like they did in olden days, although some people in the world do that, but that's not largely true for us in this Western world where we are some, in some sense civilized and uh, advanced. But nevertheless, we have our own gods. And you may well ask then, what are these gods? Well, principally, the God that we have above all things is ourselves. You see, anything is a God that we think about more than the true and the living God. And we live in a time and in a day and in an age when people are thinking about themselves above everything. Ask yourself this question as you pass by. Ask yourselves this question, ponder and think. Have you thought about God today at all? Have you thought about that one who made the heaven and the earth? That one who has created you and made you in his image? Therefore you are accountable unto him. Have you thought about him at all today? Is it not true that you have thought about yourself? You have thought maybe about your work, about your home, about your family? about maybe your pleasure, your entertainment, your sport, your money, your possessions? And is it not true that you have never thought about God at all today? He's not in your thoughts at all. Well, that would tell me, friends, that you are worshiping another God. It may well be yourself. It may well be your possessions. It may well be your car. It may well be your home. It may well be your wife, or your husband, or your children, or your grandchildren. But the Bible tells us that we are to have one God, and one God alone. He is to be the one that is uppermost in our minds and under our thoughts. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, the Bible says. And therefore, we have broken that first commandment. And the Bible goes on to tell us, you can read it in James chapter 2 for yourself, that if we have broken one of God's laws, we have broken them all. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Have you taken the Lord's name in vain today? Have you cried out, O Lord, or O my God, today? That is taking the name of the Lord in vain. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. What is the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What is the Sabbath day? Tomorrow, friends, the Lord's day, the Sabbath day is tomorrow. What will you be doing tomorrow? Will you be here on Buchanan Street buying and selling? Will you be attending a place of worship? Will you begin out for lunch or whatever? The Bible tells us that we are to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What else does the commandment tell us? Well, commandment five is honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. What is the sixth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. What is the eighth commandment? Thou shalt not steal. What is the ninth commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What is the tenth commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Is it not true, friends, as we pass by, as we think on these things, that we have broken these commandments? Is it not true that in some sense we are all ones who have broken the sixth commandment? What does the sixth commandment say? Thou shalt not kill. Oh, but you say, I've never killed anyone in my life. And that may well be true in a physical sense. You may not have killed anyone in your life. But if you've spoken rashly, if you've spoken in an angry manner, 
against someone without a cause. The Bible calls that murder by words. What about the seventh commandment? What does it say? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Have you committed adultery? Friends, the reality is who has not committed adultery? We may not have committed adultery uh, physically, but the Bible says if we look upon a person to lust after that person, we have committed adultery with them in our hearts. You see, the law of God is not just concerned with what we do with our hands and our feet. The law of God is concerned about our thoughts, about our words, as well as our actions. And therefore, we can break these commandments by our words and by our thoughts. That's why the Bible says to us, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, without exception, we have sinned and we have come short of the glory of God. We have not reached his mark. We have not reached the level that he requires. You see, God is a holy God. And God demands absolute perfection. Absolute perfection. He will not tolerate us breaking one sin, whether it be in thought or word or deed. That's the God with whom we have to do with. That's the God who made us. That's the God who has given us his commandments to obey. And we have broken every single one of them, the Bible says. Now I realize to many of you, this is something you may have heard for the first time, and you're somewhat startled. This is not good news for you. I thought you said, Minister, the gospel was good news. Well, of course, the gospel is good news. But before you will ever understand the good news, you must realize and you must appreciate the bad news. And the bad news from heaven today is that we're all guilty in the sight of God. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how well educated we are. It doesn't matter how many uh, times we've gone to the house of God. These things don't matter in one sense. Because as far as God is concerned, his verdict on mankind is we're all guilty. I'm trying to think of that verse in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. For God saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every thought of his imagination was only evil continually. That's God's verdict on mankind before the flood came. And that's God's verdict upon mankind today. For God saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every thought of the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. That's the verdict of God. But you know, when God saw mankind like this, when God saw mankind up to their necks in sin, what did he do? Did he condemn mankind? No, he did not. What did he do? He sent forth his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There, friends, you have the wonderful news of the gospel. There you have God's answer to our greatest need and our great predicament that we find ourselves in because we are sinners before God. And because we're sinners, we cannot deal with this problem ourselves. It's impossible. It's too great a problem. Sin has too much hold and too much power over us. We cannot deal with this ourselves. Going to church will not do it. Praying will not do it. Confessing your sins before a priest will not do it. No, manner, no matter or manner of good works will take away your sins. You must indeed go to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must have dealings with him. That's why he came. This is a trustworthy saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, the Apostle Paul says, of whom I am the chief, he says. And this surely is good news for us. If the verdict of God upon us is that we are sinners, yet he has sent for someone to save us from our sins. Who is that person? That person is none other than the eternally begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the one that we bring to you today, the one that you must trust upon today, the one who alone can save you from your sins and bring you to glory. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 14, verse 6, read it in the Bible yourself. Don't take my word for it. But what does it say? John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And when he said, no man cometh to the Father, what did he mean? He meant no one will get to heaven except they come by the Lord Jesus. He alone must take us. That's his role. That's his job. That's his title. What it is, is to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's what he did. And you know, friends, on the cross, surely you know about the cross. Surely you know that Jesus Christ was crucified. And you know there, friends, as he was hanging on the cross, as there was nails being put through his hands and feet, and as a sword was piercing his side, do you know what happened? Do you know what he said? He cried out that day when he was on the cross, it is finished. It is finished, he said. What did he mean by that? What he meant was that his life had been victorious. He had come on a rescue mission and in order to save people and in order for us to, pro to proclaim a gospel, he had to lay down his life. He had indeed to offer up his life as a sacrifice and he was able to say to the whole universe, to God his Father and to all those round about him, it is finished. He has accomplished everything that was necessary. And all we have to do today, friends, is to call upon him. It's to come unto him. It's to believe upon him. It's to receive him as Lord and Savior. It is to repent from our sins and to trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's required of us, whether we're young, whether we're old, whether we're dark-skinned or light-skinned, whether we're male or female, whether we're religious or irreligious, this is what's required of us. And if we don't have Christ, friends, we have no hope in this world because there's no other Savior. No other Savior will be able to save us. There is none. The Apostle said, For salvation is found in no other, for there is none other name given among him, given under heaven, whereby we must be saved. He alone can save. And I fear today that you're hearing this and you're passing by. You're thinking nothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't realize that your eternal happiness is bound up in Christ. And to reject him is to reject any hope whatsoever. Because the Bible tells us, read it for yourselves in 1 Timothy, for there is one God, one God, don't believe all those who tell you there's many ways to God. There's one God and there's one mediator. The man Christ Jesus who give himself, who give his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's what he did. And he did it in order that men and women and boys and girls who by nature are on that broad road that leads to destruction that they might have life, that they might have forgiveness of sins, that they might be reconciled to God through believing upon Christ, through accepting his sacrifice, through repentance and faith, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's required of you. And you must hear this message because this message is the most vitally important message that you could ever hear. What it tells you about the way to be right with God. And it's only through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the tracks that we're handing out today from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing is, where are you going? Friends, it's a very serious question. As you move here, as you go back and forth, where are you going? 
Where are you going? Or you're not thinking about it. You don't want to think about it. But you must think about this. Because life is brief. Life is short. Life is uncertain. And where are you going when you pass into eternity? Here you are. Maybe you're young. And you believe you have all your life in front of you. And God willing, that is true. But you know, friends, life is very uncertain. I've been to funerals of younger than you. And you need to ask yourselves, where are you going when the time shall come, when you shall pass into the other world? Where are you going? You know, the Bible tells us there's only two places. Two places. There's either heaven, a glorious place, a place where the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell with the angels and with those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Or there's a terrible place, an absolutely terrible place, and the Bible describes it in various ways. It calls it the bottomless pit. It calls it the place of torment. It calls it hell. Where are you going, friends? Don't listen to anyone that, that will tell you there's another place. Don't listen when people will tell you there's a place called purgatory where you can be prepared for heaven. Nonsense. You know, when the thief was on the cross and he said to the Lord Jesus, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What did Jesus say to him? Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. There's no purgatory. Once we leave this world, we're into the eternal world, and we will make our home forever and ever and ever and ever in heaven or hell. What will it be, friends? We want to tell you the way to heaven because, friends, by nature, every single one of us, the moment that we come out of the womb, we're on the broad road that leads to destruction. That it, that's the way it is by nature because we're sinners. But there's a way of escape. And it is a pleasure. And it is a privilege. And it's an awesome responsibility this afternoon to come. And to be on the street. And to tell you something about the way to heaven. The way whereby you might be reconciled to God. Where you might have your sins forgiven. And you might be made ready for that glorious and holy place. You see, I know. I know you all want to go to heaven. There's no doubt about it. No one wants to go to hell. That's true. We would be madmen if we wanted to go to hell. But you all want to go to heaven. You all want to go to heaven. That's true. But friends, you must be prepared for heaven. As we are by nature, we would not enjoy heaven. Heaven is a holy place. The Bible tells us, Nothing impure shall enter into heaven. And if it were possible, we're speaking hypothetically here, but if it were possible for us to get into heaven the way we are, we wouldn't enjoy it. It would be hell to us because we must be changed. We must know that experience that the Bible talks about, about being born again about the Spirit of God giving us life. We must be prepared for heaven because by nature we're not. By nature we don't want to go to heaven. You know, I had someone come up here sometime when I was, when I was on Buchanan Street and he said to me, honestly, I don't want to go to the heaven of the Bible. I don't want to go to that place. He doesn't want to go to heaven. Where's he going to go then? There's only two places. I'm not making this up. The Lord Jesus Christ has told us this. And he's the one who went to the grave, who was crucified, went to the grave dead. But on the third day he rose victorious over the grave. And I will listen to him, that one who knows about the eternal world far better than anyone else far better than all our philosophers and all our educationalists. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he speaks about these things, 
He speaks with infallible authority, but he's the only one that has come from heaven. You know, there are a multitude of religions in this world, and more and more are being added every single day so that people are confused about these things. But you know what makes Christianity unique? It is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came down from heaven, suffered and died, was put into the grave, put into a sealed grave, but on the first day of the week, on the Sabbath day, on the first day of the week, he rose. A sealed grave could not hold him. And he rose. And this would tell me that we must listen to what Christ says. Because no other religious teacher, it doesn't matter who they were or who they are. They cannot speak with such authority that Christ does. He alone has come from heaven. He knows the eternal world. And he has tasted the sting of death and he has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And that's why we're on the street this afternoon. We want to bring this great and this glorious person and his message to your attention.